so this is just to introduce Paul, basically, and Paul's lecture today, which is on populism uh, in uh, in Europe, uh, serving the populist moment. Um, so just to say welcome to all the students. It's very interesting as well to hear, you know, where you are from and what you've studied before. So uh, we have, I'm, I'm certain we're going to have some interesting discussions uh, with, based on all your different uh, perspectives and experiences. But now, just simply to introduce Paul, uh, who is a professor of politics at the University of Sussex and uh, has been for quite some time, as far as I understand. Um, Paul's main foci is on populism and Euroscepticism. So he has written these primarily sort of separately. Um, he has published several books on populism and several books as well on Euroscepticism and a whole range of articles. So theoretically and conceptually, uh, he has done a lot of work on, on populism as a concept and developed that um, theoretically, but also fleshed it out with some solid empirical work so I think that really shows as well Paul's contribution, how it is this kind of combination of developing new theory by working with empirical materials. Paul's work shows, or Paul shows again and again, that populism is indeed nothing new. He shows that it's something that appears in sort of late 19th century, also something that is ongoing within during the 20th century and at how it appears uh, as episodic and also how it is chameleonic, if that's how you pronounce it, that is kind of something that adapts and therefore it can be kind of difficult to capture, but also really interesting to study and how it's also kind of perhaps important to, to let it be a bit chameleonic and um, not um, define it too narrowly, so to say, or try to pin it down too hard as a concept. If you look at Paul's more recent work and his latest articles, he talks a bit more about sort of the issues, the populism than perhaps attaches itself to, so rather than going in and working more on the definitions of populism as such, it talks about the, the issues that populists work with in order to mobilize uh, the masses, for instance. He also introduces a very interesting concept of unpolitics. So I know that Paul will talk a bit about sort of different approaches to populism, and as you might know, it's usually defined as a sort of um, antagonism uh, between a people and an elite. And Paul kind of adds on politics into that formula, so to say. So he writes about that in a chapter called Populism and on politics and populism and the crisis of democracy, for instance. So that is one of his very uh, interesting publications. He has also published a book called Populism from 2000, which is a really good book for any sort of master students or PhD students looking at populism because that defines populism and uses different sort of cases to illustrate how populism works uh, differently and these variated forms of populism and what it might look like in different countries uh, and time periods. Um, he also has a chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Populism, which you might recognize as well because it's very famous. It's been um, uh, well cited um, and published on the Oxford University Press. Um, he also has written several books then on uh, uh, Euroscepticism, for instance, uh, uh, Opposing Europe, the Comparative Party Politics of Euroscepticism from 2008, also Choosing Union, the 2003 EU Ascension Referendums from 2005. But I must say that my favorite work from Paul is the now fairly old book from 1996 called The New Populism and uh, uh, the New Politics, which is sort of a case study of um, uh, a few Swedish parties, parties in Sweden, uh, the, uh, the Greens, for instance, and also the party called New Democracy, which um, formed in the early 90s in Sweden. So that, I think, is really sort of solid empirical and theoretical uh, work uh, is an important contribution to the field and it's just for me it's it, it's been kind of a good companion when I wrote my PhD thesis in a sense to understand how you do very sort of well grounded empirical research but also contribute into the theoretical field so that is my uh, sort of uh, uh, secret tip for you as students to look into so that is just a quick introduction of Paul. And then I thought I'd say something about what I think you should perhaps think about during Paul's lectures. And that is this sort of double, double meaning of populism. 
because populism is a word that we use uh, within uh, research. So it is a theoretical analytical construct, but it is also a term that is used by the people that we study, by the politicians that we study and by the media that we study. So it is this kind of a term that is constituted both by and of the knowing subjects that we study. You know, so it has double meanings that you should be aware of. Um, and what you want to, to think about probably is also kind of what makes a populist, what constitutes populism as such, what is it? Um, it and once you are a populist, are you then always a populist? It's, 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 there are many sort of parties that are labeled as populist, but are there any limits to when they stop, start being populist and perhaps do they stop being populist, for instance? And also something we are going to talk about when we get to the discussion is the causes of populism. What, what causes populism? How comes that it erupts and why does we see, do we see so many sort of recent eruptions of populism and studies of populism, say, in the past 10 years only? Uh, and with that, I think I am going to leave it to Paul, and I hope you're pleased with that introduction. Very much so. That's very, that's very sweet. I, I like someone choosing their favourite work of mine. I, I, I was very amused. Bless you. Um, I, it would be all about Sweden. I suspect that might, might have swung it for me. Um, and it's nice that somebody still reads the, the old stuff. But, um, and lovely to hear from all of you. I mean, I really enjoyed going around the room. I'm going to share my slides in a minute so you'll disappear. But it's really useful for me to hear who, who you all are and you to hear each other. This is about populism. So the people matter. Um, so it's really nice to get a, a flavour of the room. And I, I am pleased to hear that. Um, and gathering from what you all said, you know, there's a lot of expertise here on populism. And so it does change a little bit what, what I, I will say. Um, a little bit. Uh, I'll try and be a little bit provocative and, and, and mix things up a bit and, and not give you a kind of introductory basic lecture. I'm sometimes I'm going to try and say things to try and provoke you a little bit. And I will, I'll try and ask you some questions as we go through the lecture just to, uh, just to keep you awake really, because I know it's, uh, I know it's like quite warm here for once in Britain and you might fall asleep. So, I, I, so be warned, I might ask a question. Um, and if I do that, what I'm going to ask, if you just raise your hand on the, on the, the um, on the bar or if you want to you can just unmute and say something but that's your your warning um okay so i'm very honored to, to start the the, 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 lecture, the lecture series it looks a fantastic bunch of people you've got doing this and um i'm quite envious that you're doing it actually um and in terms of setting it off therefore what i'm going to do is really kind of two or three things i'm going to just talk a little bit about um defining populism um, and different approaches to populism. I suspect many of you will know a lot of this stuff, but I think it's, I'm going to set it up in a, in a certain way. And it draws from some of the work that Liv talked about, uh, the Oxford Handbook of Populism and stuff like that, we've, where we, we categorise different approaches. Uh, and then I was going to quickly we talk about populism in Europe, where we kind of are the state of the, of the moment, as, as it were, surveying the populist moment, looking at what parties are populist and what I'm counting as populism. Um, and then I'm going to look at some of the, the differences between them and the variation there. And then we're going to finish up with some causes. But I will, uh, I won't, I won't take, a, I'll see if I can, how quickly I can do this while maintaining coherence. I won't try and uh, do too much. So, as I say, um, the, the, before I start, the, the two themes, if you like, I, I want to give you today overall, and it responds a little bit to what Liv was saying, which is, I think, I think we need to be clear about what we mean by populism. And I th particularly think we need to avoid what I would call in the post COVID period, I hope it is post COVID, uh, false positives. Too many people are identified in, in my book as populists who aren't populists. I think there's something very specific about it. And that's what's always driven me. And I think it's used too widely. So the first thing I want to say is to avoid false positives, for false, in other words, of, of falsely identifying people as populists or parties as populists when they're not. And the second thing is that when we have identified who we think are populist and we have a defence of that, I think we need to then look at the, the pluralism within that, the variation within the types of populism that we have. And so those are, those are my two things. One is to avoid the false positives, to have a clear definition. And we can have different definitions, that's fine, as long as we know what we are, we are meaning by it. And then once we understand it, looking at variation within it. I'm a comparative scholar. 
and I tend to look at lots of different countries because I'm not very good at details. I tend to look over, over, over broadly, and that's and I that that allows you to see the variation. It, there's some bad things about that, which means I don't go enough into depth, but it means that I often see variation where people often see one case and they say that's what's happening everywhere. We see democratic backsliding and say Hungary or. And, and therefore that's what's happening elsewhere. And I'm, I'm very suspicious of that. So that's the thing I, I wanna challenge you about. Okay. So let me start off with the, uh, the definitions of populism. It's sort of obligatory when you talk about populism, you have to define it. It's, I'm gonna ignore that first slide. It just says there's more of it. You can, I think you will know that. <laughs> so I'll move on. Um, the first thing I'm gonna say is definitions. I, in, the, in the handbook, uh, the Oxford handbook on populism, um, which uh, Cristobal Rovira Kaltwasser and I and a couple of others produced, we, we broke up the types of approaches into three approaches. And I see it's been picked up by other scholars, people like Ben Moffat has a very similar sorts of approach to categorizing how people look at, at populism. And I think it's important to get in your head that these are very different aspects of populism. Well, so no, they're different, very different approaches that often don't overlap. For some people, populism is a strategy. It's a way of gaining power. Um, and therefore, that has important implications for how politicians act, for how populists gain power. But it has the important um, elements to it, which if it's a strategy for gaining power, then it's essentially an, an empty set of ideas. You can use anything. You can use a populist strategy in search of, in service of any set of ideas. So populism, if you take a strategic view, is how politics is done. It's not what you're, or you're thinking or your ideology, and that can vary. And this is the approach of, of people like Kurt, Kurt Wayland. And this has aspects of being a sort of charismatic leader, with false promises or simplifying or whatever those kind of terms are. But that's how you attain power and it's making broad based appeals to the people in order to get office. So it doesn't say what you're going to do once you're within it. And that's, I think it's important to differentiate because often people tend to lead or to confuse the, the different sorts of uh, approaches to populism. You've got to understand what is it that you think populism is before you define it. The second set of approaches is um, best exemplified by, uh, I think, the writer Pierre Ostigui, the Canadian writer uh, who's based in Argentina at the moment, who writes about populism as he calls it a socio-cultural phenomenon. And he says it's, it's about the codes. It's about the way that that um, socio-culturally politics presents itself and he specifically says that populism um, is something that he calls it flaunts the low and he talks about the differentiation between high politics mannered uh, esoteric thoughtful uh, and low politics which is quite uh, raw uh, uncooked uh, to use that phrase um, and often uh, try to unsettle things and that's for him, for Ostergi, he, he told me the story that he came up with the idea when he was in Argentina and he went to one political rally um, of the, the, the high politics people, the conventional politicians. And he went out, he went down to the subway and he went to another rally and he came out the subway and he could see just by the nature of the crowd that it was a populist uh, movement. He couldn't tell you why, it was just that they were, they were acting differently, the language was different, there was a different feeling about it. So that's a, that's a socio-cultural approach. Um, that, uh, but the most common approach is the third, the, the ideational approach, as it's called, or populism as an ideology. And this is, this is where I would situate myself, and it's where I would argue most, most scholars sit, situate themselves. doesn't mean they're right, because they're most doing it. It's not a democracy, but it's certainly the dominant approach. Uh, and I've always thought that populism has, at its core, a set of ideas um, that if you have those ideas, you are a populist. And I came up with a definition, but Kaz Müller came up with a much better definition after me. And he, he defines it um, uh, as the, uh, the ideology that considers society to be ultimately separated into the homogeneous, into two homogeneous antagonistic groups, the pure people versus the corrupt elite. And it argues that, 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 uh, that politics should be the expression of the volonté générale, the general will of the people. That's, has Mudder's definition, and it's very widely used, and I think quite rightly so. It's a very nice little definition that kind of gets there. That says there are certain ideas, and that's different. So that doesn't, that doesn't determine the way you present those ideas, and these aren't simply a strategy. These are the core ideas um, of, of populism. 
Now, I'm now going to sort of just riff on that a little bit and say how I tend to think of populism uh, using that definition or, or an ideation approach. Um, the sources on that. And, then, and Kaz, Kaz's thing is covered in, in his uh, article, if you read his, his article. I'm going to argue that, that populism has to still stand three parts to it. And I do, I'm slightly critical of, of Muller's work in one dimension, which I'll mention in a moment. So if I see somebody and I think, and then people say, oh, is this a populist? I think, well, first of all, I think, well, are they opposed to the establishment? All populism is anti-establishment or anti-elite. This is the, the uncontentious part of this. But it does mean we have to be aware that the, the establishment could be seen in very different ways. For some populists, the establishment um, might be a metropolitan liberal elite. For some uh, populists, the, the establishment might be a corporate elite. It might be a sort of a power elite, as I'll, I'll see right now. So although they share hostility towards an establishment or the establishment, they often conceptualize it in slightly different ways. Different types of populists use it in different ways, but they all have that, that strong anti-establishment element to them. The second thing that, that's common is that people say that, that populism claims to speak for the people. I think it kind of does, but I don't think that really means that much. In the sense that I tend to think of the people in a particular way. I think of the people in relation to a concept which I prefer called the heartland. And the heartland is the idea that there is some imagined past for all populists where things were better. And that the people are actually the occupants of the heartland. Now I've put up a picture, I don't know if you can see it, I'm just gonna bit hidden by my bar of, of you guys, but anyway, it's a picture from um, the Lord of the Rings, the, the Shires. And I'm not a great, don't, I'm not a great Tolkien nut, don't, I'm not gonna go mad on this, but it's really nice imagery. In the show, if you haven't seen all three films or whatever, you can just watch the first bit, you get this idea, you don't have to fit through all three of them. Uh, and they talk about the Shires. Now the Shires are this green and pleasant land where the hobbits live. And what characterizes the, the, the heartland, the, the, the Shires in the hobbit case, is two things. One, that it's occupied by the hobbits. And they are a monolithic people. There isn't great division between them. There are arguments, because hobbits do argue a bit, um, but they're not fundamentally divided. So it's quite a monolithic uh, conception of, of the occupants. They are all hobbits, the hobbits live in the shires, and that's where they get on with things. The second characteristics of the heartland is that it's an, essentially a world without politics. Because there isn't division, because politics is what happens when we are divided, it's how to deal with conflict. Because there isn't conflict in a fundamental sense, there's no politics. And therefore that means the hobbits are just getting on with their daily life. They're just doing what they need to do to survive. Uh, and doing what they want to do to, to be happy. There isn't fundamental conflict. And there isn't there, it's a very, what I would call a very unpolitical conception of the world. So what I suggest to you is that every populist has either explicitly or implicitly an idea that there is a heartland somewhere in the past and that they, they're trying to get back to it. In fact, what they're trying to do is get back to a world kind of without, without politics to some extent. But you see this in, in, say, Trump talks about you know, making America great again. There's a particular conception of the heartland there. Um, and it's going backwards. It's not a, a utopia a, or a place we want to be built on principles. It's a sense, it's a felt sense, not a reason sense, but a felt sense as a past imagined that we've, we've lost. And we're trying to get back there. So populism is very often about going backwards, about getting back something that we've lost. Those elites, that establishment we don't like, has attacked us. So more commonly in the literature, people will talk about it being for the people. I think the people are just, they're the hobbits. They're the occupants of the heartland uh, and they have those characteristics. Uh, and I think these two, these two aspects of populism are very, very important. However, I think if you define populism with only these two aspects, I think there are certain problems. Now, I'd like to ask, can anyone think, what, anyone have a suggestion what they might what they might think might be a problem with defining populism as just being um, an anti-establishment and pro-people. Anyone got any ideas on that? If you want to either unmute. Yeah, you're gonna have to unmute because I can't see you all. 
Any thoughts on this? What would be the limits? Oh, we lost that. We'll ruin the surprise. I'm going to unshare just for a minute. No, no. no? Maybe the democratic powers, which are not populist, can fall in the definition uh, who really fight the really corrupted elite, like maybe, I don't know, Communist Party or something like that. Who was that? So I couldn't see who it was. Who was, it? was that Mariam? Yeah, it's Mariam, Mariam, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very brave of you. Well done. Um, so linked to democracy. Okay. I, I think there's a real issue here about populism. I think populism actually isn't opposed necessarily to democracy. Um, but I'm not sure that's quite what you were saying. Say it again, Mariam. I meant that maybe this definition will, with only these two elements, the definition will be too wide and the democratic powers who are not populist may fall in the definition because they may be anti-establishment if the establishment is really illiberal, corrupt, like um, autocratic establishments, for example. Okay, so it might be, it might be too broad, absolutely. Okay, yeah. Anybody else want to have a go? Any? I think uh, Claudia has raised hand and then there's a comment in the chat as well. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I can't see it, but that's my, my fault for not being technologically very good on this. Okay, Claudia, um, do you want to say? Right. Yeah, I guess the, the problem is that it doesn't completely um, capture the part where um, um, the, the part of restoring this, um, this, this, this past, right? This something that's being lost. So the, the, the third dimension would that be would then be the um, the sovereignty dimension, which could be either uh, restoring sovereignty or denying um, sovereignty as expressed by um, specific elites. I've seen that in in uh, quite a um, a few code books that um, they tend to um, distinguish. The, the restoration of sovereignty in different ways, like restoring sovereignty of the people by denying um, political rights of the elites. So I think that would be the third uh, added dimension to populism. So it's like a combination of, of the three, but to be honest with you, from what I've um, researched and measured myself, I would have a question on how would these three dimensions be then balanced out in order to uh, make a, a, a person or a political party populist. So if you like code a manifesto, like how much <laughs> the per or you know, how much yeah. the percentages of these three dimensions should be or should they be equally like close or or how would then be um how would we then be able to say um mm -hmm. whether you know is it that they just have to be present or is there a, a, a certain degree that every dimension should sort of fulfill in order to make the political party or the the, the leader a populist one? Thank you. Now you're, you're, you're already thinking about measurement. You're, you're way ahead of me. <laughs> way yeah. ahead of me there. But, um, but that's something to think about, absolutely. Um, Ail, Ail, do you want to come in? Do you want to say your but I think no, it's good. But I think Sandra was before me, so maybe he can go first, and then I can jump in. Okay, Sandra. Thank you. Um, no, I was just thinking that if we uh, define populism and approach populism from the ideological perspective, then I would say that these two components are not sufficient enough to call populism as an ideology. So that is, I just wanted to add. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you, Sandra. And I will. Um, I was thinking like the third um, component can be related to what is mostly used by most of the populist theories is the general will, the discourse on the general will and how this general will is not represented by the current establishment or as in many cases by the elites who are running who are running the country for so many years so it's kind of like not maybe a general will in what Jean-Jacques Rousseau says but a general will in the sense that something that is not sufficiently represented by those who are ruling us so we need the real people who will represent the real ideals okay thank you you know I, I... 
Interesting, right? So, so I'm I know other points in the chat, but I'll come back to those. That's a really interesting range range of answers. I'm not trying to set, get you to second guess what I'm going to say, but you've raised points of, of uh, that some of which I would I would link to, others of which are, are new to me. Measurement and stuff. I think about that later, but I, I mean I do agree. Um, I think with with Ayo and with Sander actually, I think there's not enough in these two to redefine the core of populism. And I put it slightly, you know, my point here is simply that this defines a very wide range of, of, of actors. And this defines communism and this defines fascism in various forms. They both have a conception of the people, they're both their anti-establishment. So it's not enough. And actually I go right to, to, to um, what Ayo is saying. I think that, that the, um, the core thing is that what defines populism is its understanding of politics. And, in, and Kaz Mudder's definition is about the general will. It says, well, it has an idea of the general will. Uh, and I think it's important that that third aspect is, is in it, something about politics. For me, um, I, and I put this in a, in a way, I, I, I used to say it's kind of skeptical towards the process of representative politics. But now I'm beginning to think much more about, this is an idea that Liv did mention that I've just been kind of playing with recently, the idea that populism draws on unpolitics. So what I mean by this is that, that um, when generally we need the populism to be, to be um, truly, uh, to be uh, narrow enough to actually define things and precise enough, it needs to have these three elements. It needs to be anti-establishment, it needs to have the people or the heartland in it, and it needs to have it. We need to understand what it is, how they see politics. And I think that they draw on, on politics. And what I mean by that is that the appeal of populists, not the populists themselves, but their appeal stems from the fact that they're drawing people to support them because those people are unpolitical in the sense that they're not apolitical and they're not anti-political. They just don't want to get involved in politics in a sense that they're not naturally involved in it. And I often use this metaphor some of you might not like this, but I'm not very sporty, right? But I don't think sport's a bad, say football, right? I mean, my partner's all obsessed with football, I don't know why. Now, it's not a bad thing, I have nothing against it. They get great pleasure from it, it's not a bad thing. So that, that's all right, I'm not anti it, I'm not opposed to it, but I, I'm also not without it, because I can't be without it, because my colleagues always use football metaphors or they talk about how their teams did and you know, our coffee breaks. So I, I can't simply ignore it, I, my world is, is there. And I think that's, that's the parallel I'd give. I'm, I'm unsporting in a sporting world, okay? Um, and I think populism appeals to those who are unpolitical in a political world. And you can see why that goes back to the, to the heartland, can't you? To the idea of the Shire as this kind of mythical place where, where there wasn't politics. That's what they really want, just to get on with things and not to have to deal with politics. I mean, slightly vague, because I am slightly vague, but it's, it's important for me that we understand the politics of populism, how populists appeal as a conception to me of drawing on a particular version of politics, one politics. It's how it goes about politics. So when they were to me, that person's a, pop, a populist. And I'm thinking, no, I think they're, they're pretty much, they're pretty much very political to their core. They're drawing on a sense of politics. So that's, those are the three elements to me. The third, the last picture I should probably put up earlier was a picture from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, a fa classic American film. Um, and if you haven't watched that, you've got a good two and a half hours to spare. It's a long film. It's a fantastic um, uh, story of populism because it's about a, a, a senator who gets parachuted into the Senate. And it, it, if the point of this is it, it views politics in a very negative way. He's innocent and virtuous. Uh, and, and, uh, becomes so that's my sort of thumbnail sketch, right? Those three things, for, to be a populist, you have to be anti-establishment, you have to be pro the people who have a kind of implicit heartland or an explicit heartland, and you have to have a certain conception of politics, you tend to be drawing on this, this kind of politics. I, I recognize it's vague, but I'm trying to be a little bit provocative. And that's why very often I say, when people say to me, you know, excuse me for being very nationalist here, in my country, Boris Johnson, he's a populist, and say, no, he's not populist. Yeah, he sometimes he uses anti-establishment literature. He does have a kind of heart and stuff. He's he's a conservative politician to the heart. And what you know, Bernie Sanders to me, he's he's a, he's a social democrat. He's unpolitical to me. He's not a populist. Whereas people, when they use it broadly, that's what I think they mean. So that's, sorry, that's rather a long discussion of populism. But I think that's, that that's useful. Uh, I hope it's well, I hope it's useful. I want to just now just talk about populism in Europe, and I'm taking. 
long enough I meant to, so I'm going to do this quite quickly. I was going to show you um, two, there are two charts here of, of populist parties. Oh, sorry, I meant that last part. I'm just going to call them. Sorry, bad segue in here, Tanya. Um, populism is thin centered, empty hearted, you know, um, by which populism. You can never have something that's only those three elements. It has to have other elements in the ideology attached to it. And that's, we'll come back to that in a moment. That's why we have such varieties of it. This means that populism never exists in a pure form. There is not a pure populist in the world. They always have other ideas attached to them. It might be, a, a, we'll come back to that, what sort of ideas they would be. But a populist is always something else as well as being a populist. That means that that's why it's so hard to study. That's why it's taken me 30 years and I've still not quite got it right. You know, I'm still struggling away. Um, uh, whereas if you take a sort of um, other ideologies like social democracy or conservatism or Christian democracy or ecologism, they're all self-contained. They don't need anything else, but they have enough of populism needs other ideas to make it fully form. Okay, so moving on to Europe. Well, I was... The, this is just two tables of lots of populist parties, which I think what I'm going to say to you here is that I will flick you a link in a moment. It's from an article that, that uh, done by me and a colleague in Italy called Andrea Piru, and we looked at populism before the pandemic. We just simply categorised the parties in 2019 before the pandemic hit that we really categorised them according to this sort of criteria and ideation and conception of, of, of populism. And I won't go through it because not time, but I will go through it implicitly in a moment. What I want to say here is that we skim through all these cases. There are lots of cases of, of parties here. Nearly, and I'm not, I, I for, forgive me, those of you who are from the Western Balkans and Turkey, I've not included everybody. It's, it's a very EU centered list, plus, plus um, um, Switzerland and the UK now, but it's only a limited set of countries. But it, it does show us there's a lot of variety. And that's what I want to just talk about. Uh, now for the break up. Um, there are three ways in which we can see populism in Europe, in contemporary Europe, in a, in a very you know, pluralistic way, or in, in lots of varieties. The first is we have populist parties now, pretty much in every case. In, in, that, in that table, um, in the article, there are only two countries that I don't think really have populism at the moment, and that's Malta and Ireland. A lot of people don't agree with me on Ireland to think Sinn Féin is populist. But there are, there are some cases where you've hardly got any populism. But pretty much most countries have some form of populism. But populism varies in its degree of support. Okay? In, some, in some cases, it has very high support. In some countries, it has very low support. In the extreme case, you know, in, in countries like you know, from here from Hungary, you've got countries where you've got uh, support over 40% of the population. So, uh, high, high 30s in, in Poland, um, where it's become the majority. So you have very high levels of support. But we also have countries where there are very, very small parties that, that, gain, that are populist and haven't really gained a lot of support. And that's where I kind of came into it. When I first started doing populism, it was always small parties, according to small insurgent parties, uh, challenging populism, uh, challenging the establishment. So there's different, so I'd say there's a, there's a populist way. There is a way, but it's in different, it's got different heights in different countries. Secondly, you've got real variety in, in whether populism is a long-standing feature. And we've just had the, the French election, so I'm going to mention Marine Le Pen and, and the National Rally or the National Front, as it used to be. This, you know, this is a part that's existed since the early, early um, 1983. So it's existed for a long, long time. Uh, in fact, even before that, it was formed. And it's, it's, it's grown over time and built and developed over time. But that's actually quite unusual. There aren't that many parties that have sustained themselves over time, over a long period of time. Maybe you know, I'm sure you can think of some in some cases. But in a lot of countries, you have parties that have come for a short period of time and have disappeared, or maybe only recently have emerged. Maybe recently have emerged and done very well, like ANO and the Czech Republic. And so on. You know, it doesn't mean because it's new, it doesn't mean it's not a highly successful one. But there are very few that have been sort of long standing cases. There are countries which, um, as a populism scholar, I, I like to think of as the kind of the gift that keeps on giving to the populism scholars. And these are the countries where you have, there are a few of these countries where they have loads of populist cases and they keep changing. I mean, God bless the Netherlands. 
God bless Greece, God bless Italy. You know, there are lots of different cases of populism there, and they keep on coming, and they keep on, Italy especially, you've got to love Italy. I mean, not just the food and the people, but, but the, the, the cases of populism, they change over time. It used to be the League, and it used to be Berlusconi, and now, uh, and now the, North, the Northern League has become the League, and, and, and Forza Italia has disappeared, but now you've got the, the Brothers of Italy. There's always some populist in, in Italy going for it. And even with the Netherlands, there's been sort of four or five different parties that have been populist. And in those cases, you have countries where you have, it's almost like, almost like you have a supply of populist um, feeling and different parties will, will, will preserve that. And that, that's very different from most countries where often it's one case at a time. So again, be sensitive to the fact that some countries have, have a lot, might have different numbers of parties and some have a constant need for it in different forms. And the last thing that's obviously very significant is that when I started doing populism, it was, as I say, it was about insurgent parties, parties that were on the edges, on the peripheries. And I was interested in, in them partly because they were insurgent peripheral phenomena. But you've clearly seen the mainstream of, of populism, that we now have populist governments in, in Hungary and Poland. But we've also seen, you know, that, that, that have essentially wholly populist governments with majorities of populism. We also have countries in the past where you've had governments which have a small component of populism, populist as part of coalition parties. I think it's the, uh, uh, the Austrian Freedom Party uh, in the early 2000s, that period in office with the, uh, the centre right there. So you often you have had instances, instances where populists have served in government, but not in majority populist uh, governments. But you also have cases, in many cases, where populists have not been government at all. In the, in the article that, that uh, Andrea Pirro and I did, we looked at, in 2019, as an almost random year, we call it random, but actually it's quite an interesting year, given it's before the pandemic year, how many of the parties had had um, some period in, in office? That, just, that might mean, as I say, as a junior coalition partner, or maybe been in government for a bit and gone out of it. And we found, actually, it was a surprisingly high number, 23 out of 63 parties in that year had had periods in office. Was when I started studying populism, it was, it was very, very rare to see a populist anywhere near that. So, you know, the, there is a, a populist wave. It has different, it has different heights, it has different strengths, and it has different relationships in government across Europe at the moment. We need to be careful not to overgeneralize, from, from, especially from the spectacular things. The second way in which they vary is goes back to the bit I almost missed out about how populism is, is hearted or thin centre. Um, the populism takes forms that can be on the left or on the right. Casmuda uh, and, and Cristobal Rivera Calpas use the idea of inclusionary and exclusion. They compare European and Latin American populism. And they point out that Latin American populism is much more inclusionary about creating cross class coalitions. Whereas in European cases, Problems intended to be exclusionary, about the anti immigrant and particularly ethno nationalist, perhaps, if you like. Um, but the fact, the fact is that we see both, uh, both forms in both cases. In other words, Latin America has seen some left the right populists, and Europe does see some left wing varieties of populism. And when we came to, to look at the parties, we looked at these 63 parties that we thought were populist in, 60, in uh, uh, 2019. We did come to we. Uh, we, I said we drew, Andrea drew the very nice picture. If anything's good, it's not nice. And he, he just categorized the, uh, the different ideological forms of these populist parties in the continent. And the, the diagram clearly shows that the vast majority of them are on the radical right. But it also shows there are other, other varieties of populism. There's radical left populism, things like the Danos and the Olympian and Syriza in Greece. Um, but they're also centrist and, and moderate right and, and, and what we call ambiguous conceptions of populism. The point here, again, is not to overgeneralize. Not all populism in Europe is on the radical right. And I think very often people tend to assume it is and tend to talk about populism on the radical right as being synonymous. They're not. Now, it's fine to talk about radical right populism, but you need to be careful that when you're talking about that, you're not also talking about left wing voting populism. I'm always interested in trying to see what those core elements that cut across all different um, varieties of populism. So we have real ideological diversity uh, in Europe, and we have left wing voters and right wing voters. 
The last way the properties varies is, and this overlaps a little bit, imagine here. I argue that it, it kind of has different frames and different issues that it focuses on. And very much, this is the chameleonic element of populism. In different countries, different issues will resonate. And so populists, if they're being anti-establishment, they'll pick up the things that really resonate with that anti-establishment rhetoric, and they'll emphasize different things. In some countries, and a lot of countries, they'll focus on immigration, especially those who are radical white populists. You can see that as a key aspect. But we've also seen a focus on austerity, on um, exclusion of the poorer population, especially after the economic crisis. And the left, left wing populists or inclusionary populists tend to, to focus on that as part of their agenda. But there also there are elements of, of, of other right wing populists that do focus on economic issues. And you see that in cases like I would argue, including the law of justice. In some cases, not a few are now than there used to be, admittedly. There used to be part parties who would focus on sort of sub national um, regionalism. So the, the Lega League in Italy used to be a, a northern, a northern league focusing on a particular part of Italy and making a claim that it was distinct. They changed that because they know they can get more votes by being national. But you also see that with the um, Flemish bloc in, in Belgium having the, the regions component to that. Not so common, but some good parties have that. Populist parties also focus on corruption, and that might be focusing on the corruption of, of the establishment, um, or it might be, I would say, the government elites themselves are corrupt, or it might be focusing on an institutional corruption in the sense that the system doesn't work so well. Different forms of corruption, I think, is an important aspect of the populism that always kind of likes to focus on corruption. Some populism at the moment in Europe focuses upon values. I think you see this. Uh, very much in, in, in the Orban, uh, as if the Poland emphasizing the anti liberalism that we saw in, in the Kalmudda region. We have a look at that. You know, this is a key aspect for, for many populists now that they don't like the liberalism. Um, whereas that's not really the concern for, for populists in other parts of Western Europe. But they load on that, but that's the key problem. And the last point I highlight is European integration. Again, you've got to be careful here. Nearly all populists are Eurosceptic, but not all populists are Eurosceptic, and not all Eurosceptic populists. Um, but Europe has provided, the European Union project has provided a very useful establishment for populists to mobilize against. So there is clearly an overlap. Um, in, in my country, I would argue that the populist form of politics was best articulated by UKIP and the Brexit Party, who's the original rationale was purely about getting out of the European Union. So, because Britain has this strange relationship with European integration, that's what the reform of populism is focused on in this country. In most other, other countries, if it's picked up, Euroscepticism is a secondary issue. Um, not always, sometimes it's quite important, but to different degrees. Um, and we need to also be careful about Euroscepticism to differentiate between. Those who argue for exit and those that simply have a critical the difference between what I would call hard Eurosceptic and soft Eurosceptic. Well, the point here, this is almost like a, a menu. Um, and there's a list of the sort of the, the, the treats on offer for, for a populist to pick from. And it varies what they will focus on. And even if it varies, uh, individual populists might change what they focus on. Um, I once do you keep um, Part of the broadcast, I didn't mention European integration, all this focus on immigration towards the end. So, the, you know, parties can change what they focus on. But again, to say that a party is populist in Europe doesn't necessarily say for which, it doesn't describe which issue in the frame it, it pursues in politics. So, again, there's a sense of difficulty to morality. People often say that populism is linked to. Crisis. I've always argued it linked to a sense of crisis rather than crisis, but there's no question that the past few years of European, of European politics have seen the Euro crisis and the economic crisis that followed that, and the migration and the refugee crisis. Brexit, you may want to challenge that that was a crisis. As a Brit, it certainly was a crisis, but the rest of Europe, maybe not. But it did actually change uh, uh, some of the senses of, of Europe, even those countries that were not too impacted by Brexit. So COVID 19. The, uh, the inability of governments necessarily to, to respond in the way they felt they should do. Um, uh, and those things could be used by populists. And many people thought that this was going to be a, a really powerful tool for populists. Although, in practice, 
research shows that it hasn't really benefited, it hasn't really undermined the populace, or hasn't really benefited them, it hasn't really changed the population. In the Ukrainian war, obviously those parties that have particular links to Russia and people like Marine Le Pen, for example, borrowed money from the French, from Russian banks when the French banks didn't lend it to them. Um, uh, are particularly affected by this, but then again, be careful that the populist parties in Europe are very anti-Russian. War and justice, for example, in Poland has never been a friend of Russia, to put it mildly. But what I want to suggest to you is that the, insert, uh, the, the circulating of these crises has given different impetus for different forms of populism. The fact that European populism has seen the crisis has meant that different populist actors can pick up on the, the crisis in different ways. They don't together to explain to me the rise of populism, but they may explain a bit why the populists in different countries pick up the issues that they, they focus on because some of the issues are simply so I'm just conscious of time, so I'm just I'm, I'm going to try and just do one final thing very quickly. I'm going to just there's something for you to think about in, in your, your groups. Why have we got so much populism now? I'm not going to answer that, but what I'm going to say to you is that, that there are these sorts of definitions that are put across, and there are some that are missing. I think you should be thinking about what, what's missing from this here. Some would say that populism has arise now because, it, because it, um, it, 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 it's building on the sense of polarization in politics. Um, the polarization, the, the lack of the center, the mutual exclusion of extremes of politics. So is populism a, a consequence of that? Populism has an interesting problem that is, is that it, it bases part of its appeal on the fact that it draws on polarization, but it also has the effect of polarizing politics. So it's kind of a vicious circle. For others, the main emphasis is upon the disaffection of politics. We talked earlier about, about democracy. Um, and is it the case that people have just been less satisfied with the way that democracy is functioning? I've talked about politics, but maybe it's more specific. Maybe it's about bad democracy, not the same way we raise in the answer to the question. For others, the, the rise of populism is not the rise of populism, but the demise of the centre, the failure of the mainstream. As Muller's always said, it's quite consistently, um, but there's also things that talk about um, how populism has essentially benefited from the fact that it's the decline of support for the centre left and the centre right. And if you looked at the Bahuda article that, that I suggested in the reading, um, she talks about that as one of the phenomena. The fact that people no longer feel as attacked to mainstream forces as they used to. For others, it's a larger process of value change. Um, it's a, a, a moves towards different people having a sense of how, of what values they emphasise. So Inglehart is famous for talking about the rise of post-materialism. And Inglehart and Norris have got together to say, actually, this is a reaction against the post-materialism. Post-materialism gave rise to those sorts of forces that were concerned with more abstract rights, like being the peace movement, and so on. And this is the counter-cultural movement. This is a reaction against them. So it's about the attitude that we all have towards politics in general, in very different things in different ways, particularly different generations. Have different attachments, and that's why maybe populists tend to often draw very much on older populations in terms of their support. Not always, but, but, but there is some generational change there. Some people talk about the left behind um, Matt Ford, um, sorry, Rob Ford and Matt Goodman and Frank talk about this, this term originally. They talk about UKIP, and this is the idea that what is happening is that the, the centre right and to some extent the centre right are losing their traditional constituencies. And populists, especially on the radical right, are vacuuming up those constituencies that have been left behind. The abandoned the manufacturing working class uh, that is no longer represented by the, um, the social democrats. And again, that's something that Tony Martin here, from which she made some money. For others, like, like Creasy, and I could also put on here, perhaps I should have put them, um, Ruger and Marx talk about the moments of what we call. The Gal Tan distinction, uh, uh, which is the green um, alternative libertarian versus traditional, um, sort of green alternative libertarian, that's right, against traditional authoritarian nationalism. 
And the point here is simply that the left-right dimension has become supplemented with a new dimension of conflict. And the left-right hasn't disappeared, but has become that uh, has worked interact with another dimension of politics. And that the populism, uh, uh, particularly the radical right populism, tends to uh, take advantage of the empty spaces of the created by these new social class. I realize I'm going very quickly on those. Those are those just to give you a kind of flavor of the different sorts of explanations. The things are left out of here, uh, not deliberately, but you might want to figure out what else, why do you think it is that populism has, has got such a, a prominent way of acting? Okay. The two words that always get my, my audience in the uh, lecture to listen properly, and so the words in conclusion, I won't let up. So, first of all, let's say, we clearly are having a populist moment in the world. There is, some, there is a lot of populism about. So I'm not denying that. There's clearly a wave of populism. And surveying the scene, we can see we have a lot of populism. But we need to be sensitive to the fact that populism is different forms and manifesting in different types of parties with different degrees of success and focusing on different issues. I mean, we can't treat them together, but it means we need to be sensitive to what the areas between them and not to generalize just from a few points of view. Okay. More broadly, is populism somehow an indicator of something changing with politics? You can probably see that in how I see populism, it's about if people have been drawn to unpolitics. It's drawing the unpolitical into politics, it's showing that what politics is not functioning effectively. Now, I think we need to be careful, especially as scholars of populism. We want to dismiss it. People say, oh, we, we are, we're anti populism. Well, maybe people don't like the populists, but I think that doesn't mean we, we should need to hide from the fact that populism is a reason for populism success. And that may well be the way, the way that politics is, is generated, presented, even taught by people like him is problematic. And that somehow the rise of populism has something to do with the failure of mainstream.